All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Grim, the Lord of Salt here. Today, we're going to be looking at one more video doing a reaction. Uh, this will be my last Sparking video, Sparking Zero video before Sparking Zero comes out. Um, and I just wanted to make this video. A lot of people have already responded to this video. Uh, I wanted to do my own response because, as usual, you know, a lot of people, they have their own emotional responses to it. And I like to be more objective and informative. And there's a lot of information that is going over a lot of people's heads here. So... Uh, as usual, I like to put in my two cents and, and try to set the record straight for people looking for a more objective analysis to the content that's being provided here. So, uh, let's go and This is the Sparking Zero video. Why, Spark why Dragon Ball Sparking Zero feels so familiar, not in a good way. From Gameology, not their best take, but uh, uh, let's get into it. Can you spot what's wrong with these two Dragon Ball Z games? They show the same scene. Goku and Vegeta battling it out in a Utah-looking desert. It's a classic clash that took DBZ into the modern era. And with the new engine, you can likely pick out which one is the newest game, Sparking Zero. But which one is the second newest? Does the gameplay look different? Faster? Smoother? Tighter? Closer to the source material? Besides the graphics, it's almost impossible to tell. And that's a problem. Um... Yeah, the first thing about that, the reason so many of these games look familiar is because of the source material. They're trying to, to base it on that. When you're making a, a video game on an already established property, uh, the fans of that property are going to respond better if it's more faithful to the original property, right? So if you're making a Dragon Ball video game, people expect it to look, play, sound, feel like Dragon Ball. So as a result, yeah, we've had a lot, especially lately, of these free-flying, beam-grappling video games uh, in, in different flavors, and they, they look the same because they're all mimicking the same source material, the same moves, the same specials, the same effects, the same forms. Yeah, they're going to look very similar. That's just a side effect of being faithful to the material. The second you go even a little bit deeper into how these games actually work, they're completely different, and that's a whole other ballgame. Dragon Ball Sparking Zero is looking to switch up the DBZ Arena Fighter formula, but the truth is, it fails to switch up the formula at all. There have been well over a hundred titles in the DBZ franchise, from the sublime to the absurd. But when Dragon Ball started using a boilerplate Arena Fighter template back in 2002 with the introduction of the Budokai series, the franchise has felt like it's been stuck in a... First mistake, um... And a lot of people did point this out, which is interesting because those same people will actually use a similar argument that the Budokai games led to the Tenkaichi games in development-wise. Um, this isn't in it, but as people have been pointing out, Budokai and Tenkaichi play completely different. They're completely different kinds of fighters. The old Budokai games, developed by Dimps, originally developed in Europe, they were, were made to emulate the older DBZ fighting games like Super Butoden, which were made, they were 2D fighters with a little bit of a Z application made. They were, they were made more accessible, a little easier. Uh, they, they added flying mechanics in there, big stages to fight in, and beam grapples, things like that to make it a little more of the Dragon Ball Z signature, right? And that was with the basis for the Budokai games. The Tenkaichi, or as they were known in Japan, the Sparking series, um, they were going with the free flight system, you know, flying around three-dimensional areas. It was a 3D fighter flying around these huge stages, and same thing, shooting energy blast, beam grapples, all that. Uh, which was more along the lines in the Dragon Ball Z games of Dragon Ball Z Legends on the PlayStation, which I played on this channel before. Um, that was clearly the precursor to the Sparking games, whereas the Super Butoans were the precursor to the Budokai games. The reason why it gets mixed up from a lot of people, and a lot of people that commented and have mixed it up before, is because of the, the terminology used. Uh, when Spike was developing the Sparking games in, in Japan, right? Whereas Dimps had been making Budokai in Europe. So when the Western division of Bandai Namco started to, to import these the Sparking games, they decided because the Budokai was so popular that they wanted to carry that title over. So it would hopefully bring the fan base with it. So Sparking became Budokai Tenkaichi. And that's why you'll hear a lot of people to this day mistakenly assume that the Budokai games were the basis of the Tenkaichi games. But they never were. They were... Two completely different kinds of fighters from completely different kinds of areas. Hyperbolic time chamber. 
With over 20 different DBZ arena fighters released in the past 20 years, Sparking Zero promises to be more of an exercise. Okay, another thing to look at real quick. Um, I can't really get it to... ...released in the past 20 years. All right. Another thing people like to point out, a lot of these aren't arena fighters. Um, but I, that's, a, that's another thing um, I've gotten to the age where I've realized that arguing over semantics is pointless. Right? You can try telling people The Legend of Zelda wasn't the first RPG ever made, but they've got to set in their head that Zelda wasn't an adventure game, it was an RPG. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. You can argue with them forever, and it's, it's not going to change anything. You know, just looking... <laughs> these games are all over the place. Dragon Ball Z Legends is a mobile game. You know, Fighter Z was is a traditional fighter, 2D fighter. Uh, same with the Budokai games. Uh... Sagas was an adventure game. Xenoverse, a lot of people like to bring up Xenoverse. Kakarot's not on here. Uh, but there, you know, Xenoverse is, people call it more of an RPG because it has the RPG elements. I still call it a fighter because at the core it is a fighter. It was made by Dimps to be a fighter. But um, they just added the creative character and the RPG elements in there. It's like window dressing. Super Dragon Ball Z. A super Battle. I don't even know what that is. I thought that was Super Dragon Ball Z. That was a, an older traditional fighter. That would make burst limit is the same as the Budokai games. It's a 2D fighter. You know, Raging Blast and two, those were successes. I'll talk about them another day. Uh, and Xenoverse, of course. Yeah, I already mentioned that. So yeah, just going through these, a lot of people would say, "Oh, this isn't a, a arena fighter. That's not an arena fighter." The the problem with the term arena fighter is I don't think it really applies to these games at all. Um, certainly not to the Sparking games personally, because the, the atypical arena fighter is considered to be Smash Brothers, right? Whenever people talk about arena fighters, they always pull up footage of, of uh, Smash Brothers. But Smash Brothers was a 2D fighter, plays more like the old Budokai games, right? It's not a 3D fighter, it's not a big... And uh, with the, the free flying that Dragon Ball is known for, it's kind of unique. You know, the only games that come close are like the uh, Jump Force, which I think is also made by Spike. There's probably some other uh, anime fighters that come close to it, but the only other one I've played is Naruto, which is similar in a lot of ways, but definitely not free-flying, right? It's, it's definitely not the same kind of combat, even though it is a 3D anime fighter. So that's why I don't like using Arena Fighter for these games, because I don't think it it applies in a way that, that makes sense of it. And you can't, you definitely can't say that Budokai wasn't an Arena Fighter if you're going to say Smash Brothers is. So, again, it's, it's all semantics. It doesn't really matter. But that's why I like to use different terminology myself when I talk about these things, because it's just a little easier. For my sake, I always separate them into just two, when they're fighters, and they're obviously fighters, there's 2D fighters and 3D fighters. There have been RPGs in Dragon Ball Z. There have been adventure games. You know, I just played a beat em up with from Dragon Ball Advanced Adventure, right? That also has a fighting game component to it, but it was primarily a beat em up. So you, you have those, right? And uh, so I just wanted to, to clarify that for you guys as well. And uh, as a comment that a lot of people have made. Sparking Zero promises to be more of an exercise in nostalgia than an actual competitive fighting game. But she's got a new hat. <laughs> Dragon Ball fans deserve better. Full disclosure, I've been a huge Dragon Ball fan since I stumbled across it on Spanish Access Television when I was 10 years old. I love Dragon Ball. It means more to me than any other animated franchise. I name my cat Piccolo and sometimes dress him up like Lord Beerus. That's why I need Dragon Ball Z to do better. Looking back on the past is comforting, but we can't live in it forever. We deserve either a transformative leap forward for the series or a sequel to the only transcendent Dragon Ball game over the last decade. Okay, um... Or a sequel to the... What they're really going on about here, this is a lot of flavor text. Uh, they're upset that instead of getting a sequel to Fighter Z, in their mind, we're getting uh, Sparking Zero, a sequel to an older franchise. And... Uh, it's, it's a strange argument to make because, again, they're, they're different types of fighters, not just even the 2D, 3D thing. Uh, but he keeps calling, you know, it a real fighter and a competitive. I always call them competitive fighters because there's competitive fighters and there's casual fighters, right? They, they appeal to different audiences. Competitive fighters are all about balance and all about skill. Ca uh, casual fighters are usually more about presentation. You know, uh, Sparky Zero is definitely a casual. Most Dragon Ball Z games are casual fighters. It's very rare to get a proper competitive fighter out of Dragon Ball Z. Fighter Z was one of the exceptions. You know, so was Super Dragon Ball Z back in the day. So was Hyper Dimension before that. 
Right, those were proper fighters. Hyperdimension was. Super Butoden was not. That was a casual fighter. You know, uh, so Dragon Ball Z Legends was a casual, casual 3D fighter. You know, and again, you're getting into semantics here where it's pointless to argue the genre. But for the sake of what they're arguing, Fighter Z came from uh, came from a different company. Okay, came from the same company. They, they just came out with um, they just came out with a new Guilty Gear. Guilty Gear Strive came out. So they've been working on that. That's why we haven't seen some new stuff content-wise for Fighter Z, right? And they've made uh, like they've made DBZ games before, so that we could still get a Fighter Z sequel down the road. I would hope so because it, it is a great game, and I'm a big fan of it. I'm all for getting another one. Uh, it got way more support than I expected it to, because it uh, I never expected it to get so many characters. You know, it started with a smaller roster. I expected that to pretty much be it, maybe a few DLCs, but. They almost, they pretty much doubled that fucking roster, which is, is really impressive. And then they added all the fan service, the dramatic openings, dramatic endings, and all that stuff. Um, and I still think Fighter Z is just the cleanest looking of all the fucking games we've gotten. Arxis, the name of the company that I developed, it's, uh, they, they've always done excellent looking fighting games and really good fighting games. They've made themselves famous with Guilty Gear, among others. Uh, they've got other projects as well. Guilty Gear isn't even the only one they've been working on. So the fact that they turn out so many quality titles, just banger after banger after banger, and keep supporting it for so long, uh, is extremely impressive. And I hope whoever has the license, to Dragon Ball currently, does approve another Fighter Z down the road from Arxis if Arxis is open to it, because it would. I'd, I'd love to have more of these. You know, I'm all for it. But getting a new sparking game from another company doesn't mean we can't get another from this one that we can't get another fighter z right this is this is kind of a delusional take this is where it gets off um there's nothing wrong with liking fighter z but having sparking doesn't mean you can't have fighter z it, it's i would be very surprised if it drew too much attention fighter z is already kind of on the decline popularity wise in general because it's been out for a while you know most people move on to the newer thing the competitive crowd they've mostly moved on they're most of them are playing Guilty Gear Strive now, probably, or getting ready to. And um, among Tekken 8 and Street Fighter 6 and all that, they've got their own thing they're doing. Not to mention the new Marvel vs. Cab concept that came, just, just came out. So those those gamers are busy with other things. They're not. They're, most of them are not going to be playing Sparking Zero, right? Some of them will. The DBZ fans will. You know, they've, and they probably bounced back and forth between Fighter Z and Xenoverse for a while, but most of them probably left when they finished the story modes for the characters they liked from Fighter Z. Because they're not good competitively. That's why one of the reasons they play casual is because they're they're not good enough to play on a competitive level and to hold their ground. So they they go to other casual games to have a more casual experience. So they play Kakarot and they play Xenoverse and things like that. And they will definitely be looking forward to Spark Zero. But yeah, it's you, you still you still got your Fighter Z. It's not even that old of a game. It's still available. Seamus. <laughs> it's still available on every console, right? So. Uh, go ahead and, and enjoy your Fighter Z, man. But uh, but yeah, we've we've still got plenty of food on the plate, and that's not gonna fight, and that, that has no impact on Fighter Z. Only transcendent Dragon Ball game over the last decade. I've played Dragon Ball Sparking Zero, and unfortunately, my fears were confirmed. This is deja vu all over again. Now, the Sparking Zero graphics are the best they've ever been. And I applaud them for having destructible environments and trees that sway when hit with key power. But graphics alone do not make a game. When you dissect a match, it's much slower than it looks. Real impact and damage is far apart. And it doesn't have the back and forth, keep them guessing momentum battles of top fighting games. We're seeing stagnation in the gameplay sphere, where Sparking Zero is extremely similar to the last several dozen Dragon Ball Arena fighters. It feels more like the return of the EA Sports College football franchise than a new spin on Dragon Ball. Uh, again, notes on this. This guy is playing a pre-release version of the game, so it's not going to be an accurate representation of what you get. This is another problem with running to make clickbait. You know, we've seen a lot of clickbait from the, the second and upper bigger channels lately. You know, tons and tons of the same goofy stuff over and over. And all of it's it's pre-built. You know, there's going to be day one deals, uh, a day one update that comes out, a day one patch. There, there always is. You know that they aren't playing online servers. They can't tell you what the connectivity is going to be like. And even if they could, it's not going to be accurate to what it's going to be on release. So it's it's you're not getting an accurate assessment of that here. But even so, 
Right? And the funny thing is, he could have made an argument out of this, out of the stagnation, because what people don't realize, they don't recognize, is that the the sparking game engine was used to make the Blast games. Raging Blast, Raging Blast 2, Ultimate Blast, which we know is Ultimate Tenkaichi, which opens a whole new door we don't want to go into. Um, it was the same engine, so they upgraded the engine. And it was from the same people, the same time period. They upgraded the engine, they, they significantly revamped the character models from scratch, which is why we had a smaller roster. And it, it was, they doubled the moveset. They improved a lot of finishing moves for characters. That's where the, the transformation animations for Freezing Cooler come from. I was so happy to see they brought them back. They came from Raging Blast. That's not a sparking thing. You know, so... Uh, but other things from Raging Blast, we lost. We lost the doubled move set. Every character had five supers in Raging Blast. Every one of them had at least five supers. Now we're back to two supers per character. And we, we might be able to customize some of them. We don't know yet. People haven't gone into that too much. But... There's, it's we lost. That's why we're back to having three Gokus from Dragon Ball Z. Because Spark at Raging Blast had one because you could just switch them out. You know, you could give them KO Ken attacks and have them turn Super Saiyan. You could have them in any outfit and and still be doing all this stuff. You know, so it's uh, and so we lost on that. We did. We lost a lot of attacks and a lot of animations, and they're gone and they're not going to come back. Most likely, it's it's possible it's in there. People haven't dug it up. It's possible they'll bring some stuff back as DLC. Uh, but that stuff is walked back. Another example, Vegeta, right? Vegeta with the Scouter. Uh, they went back to his old finisher. His old ultimate was the Dirty Fireworks. Dirty Fireworks was in Raging Blast, but it was a rush attack, which it should be, because it's not a powerful attack. He used it to take out a weak enemy in a kind of flashy way. I've never been a big fan of that move. But it's there so he can use it against Kui, and that's it. Right? He, they gave him a much better finisher... In addition to new rush attacks that he's also lost. You know, he had his rush attack he used to finish Jace, which was an awesome sequence. I'd much rather have that if you were going to replace the, the finisher he had. You know, they could have kept that one. That was a much cooler sequence. Uh, but the new one they gave him was that giant energy blast he used against Frieza, which was also an awesome attack. You know, and any of those would have been better. I would rather he had the, like, the proto-final flash that he used on Raccoon, you know, with the rush attack before it. That would have been a great finishing animation. You know, but we didn't get that. We're back to Dirty Fireworks. This is walking back. So they could have made the argument that they're walking this engine back a lot, because they did. They went with a, they went with the Spark and 3 engine. They did not go with the Raging Blast one. And we missed out on a lot of things because of that. All right? And, if, and the only reason people complained about Raging Blast was the content. Well, the content's there in this one. You know, so they could have... They could have you could have had the best of both worlds. You could have had the better version of the engine with the new content... Because there's no reason you couldn't just slap those in there. It's not like, you know, they didn't have giant transformations in Raging Blast. That's because they didn't have the time to put them in. That's the only reason. You know, it wasn't because it wasn't compatible with the engine at all. It might have affected performance. That's probably the argument you might have gotten out of it back then. But that's clearly not an issue anymore. So, yeah. They could have made the argument that it's stagnating and it's walking things back. But they didn't. Uh, they went with the argument that it basically should be competitive only. Which is not a good argument to have. Updated graphics with familiar controls. And I need to talk about those controls, because if you've ever wondered what it's like to be one of the Z Fighters, turn elsewhere, because the controls are not great. So they're going to go into a section here. Now, the controls for the sparking engine are not easy to adapt to by any means. You know, I played Dragon Ball Z games since I was a kid, which go back before Budokai, okay? Okay. I played Dragon Ball Z Legends I, on PlayStation. I played Final Bouts. I played Ultimate Battle 22. I played uh, Legend of the Super Saiyan from the Super Nintendo. You know, I play these older games. And uh, and some of the Super Butoans and Hyper Dimension and all that. When I came, and I was fine with Budokai, when I got Tenkaichi, I had a lot of trouble adapting to that control scheme. That game kicked my ass for a long time. Because it's not... It's not a conventional or accessible control scheme. It is, it's weird, you know, and, it's, and I played, it's played so similarly to, to Legends on PlayStation 1. You know, pressing up to go forward, down to go back, kind of tankish, right? Because you're in a 3D environment. And, uh, and you know, doing flashy finishing moves and all that stuff. The, so it's, it's kind of similar to, to that, but it still took me a long time to figure out the pacing and the, the way sparking handles that engine is rough for newcomers you know it is uh 
good or bad, it's you do get over it. And when you get over it, you can get good, and you can get very good. There are people who get into the meta, and do kind of get into the competitive side of things here, right? It's, it's not a huge competitive side, but it does exist, and you can adapt and get into it. This person clearly didn't put the time in to do that, which is unfortunate, but that's what happens when you're trying to squeeze the content out as early as possible to get all the clicks. This, this is the side effect of making clickbait, guys. Definitely, there's almost no character differentiation. A lot of the characters share animations and combos. Functionally, they're probably closer to a dozen or so character types, and that's being generous. With 182 slots, who's champion at the bit to play characters like Nail and Kakunsa? If they're gonna go all out, I want some crazy characters. Bulma in a robot, Taco Shirt Krillin, World Tournament Announcer, Farmer with a Shotgun. Pay tribute to Toriyama by having one of his self-inserts be playable. There is an aspect of power scaling in Sparking Zero that's supposed to reflect the show's lore. Someone like Super Saiyan Blue Goku hits several times harder than Yamcha, which he well should, but that's a poor substitute for balance. Uh, yeah, he's complaining about uh, a lot of the engine here, and the complaints again come from just that it's not a competitive fighter. It's not balanced. It's It doesn't have the variety he wants. Uh, sparking is all about that roster. That's what makes it a casual fighter. You know, I would argue, again, talking about older fighters, you know, everyone likes to call Mortal Kombat a traditional fighter, but it isn't. Mortal Kombat traditionally was more casual. It had the same kind of copy-paste control scheme for all the characters. They all did the same basic move set. They just had different special moves and finishers. And you get the same thing here. So it could have a and it focused more on its story and its presentation back in the day. Now, it tried to get competitive later, and it basically failed hard at that. So it's still a joke among the fighting game community. But it's still enjoyed by some of the fans, <laughs> not by me, but, you know, some of them still like it. So, uh, And that's the difference between a, a casual game and a competitive fighter. The competitive fighter is only going to appeal to the competitive crowd. And, yeah, it is better on a technical level. There's no denying that better because of the balance it's better for the complexity but some people just want that presentation and they just want those characters in there they don't care if you know all the kamehamehas look the same they're supposed to because again source material right they don't care if all the a lot of the characters play the same they want to be able to play the whole roster uh they are trying to add more diversity because they're adding the new fighter types in there, and I'm not sure what kind of impacts those are going to have. They're, they're bringing custom items into it, and that's going to have an impact on how the the game plays. So there, there is a lot of variety there. There is some depth. But yeah, generally it's a more casual experience, because people, they want that character count. They've made this clear with previous titles. Again, Raging Blast got blasted, because it had a smaller character count. It didn't matter all the advancements it made and all the improvements. It didn't count for squat. They wanted that character count, and that's the, the lesson that they've taken coming into this sparking release. Uh, that's why they've walked things back, because they are f limiting the size of the, the move set and the move pool so that they can have a bigger roster, and people want that. That's the, the casual audience is bigger than the competitive one. So if you want to sell more games, you want to appeal to the, the casual crowd. As a general rule, nothing wrong with competitive fighters. They have their place. They always will. But this is that's the difference, okay? This guy, basically, he doesn't want there to be casual fighters. He just wants the competitive games. Legacy of Goku retold the Z story, but had Goku punching wolves. Kakarot retold the Z story in its entirety. Xenoverse retold the story with some what-if and time travel elements and included a somewhat lacking create a character. Sparking Zero also has a story mode, but it'll be thin because we've seen it before. Where are the well thought out stories that challenge the player's perceptions rather than regurgitate it? Heck, where's the story of Dragon Ball Pre Z? How far will we get in the manga? Will we get manga only characters like Moro? Why not play through some of the less loved but still incredible movies like Super Android 13 or have Janemba's Hell as a stage? What about a Okay, so now that you're complaining about the story, which is weird, because competitive games don't need story. But, <laughs> but you know, they're expecting the best of both worlds here. But regardless, um, yeah, the, 
and I've mentioned this in other videos, the trick with Dragon Ball games is you're going to see the same stories, and you're going to see the popular ones, right? The ones that appeal to the largest masses. So you're going to see Dragon Ball Z primarily, you know? You're not going to see a lot of Dragon Ball. You're not going to see a lot of GT. Even if the characters are there, that doesn't mean you'll get the story. Um, and Super's been introduced now, so Super's the new Z, you know? So Super, it's, it's part of the standard now. And that was a big part of the marketing for this game, because you also, again, have to realize that as far as base games go, this is the first full-fledged game to come out after uh, the end of Dragon Ball Super. So we've got the entirety of that new branch of the franchise to cover and naturally they were going to be putting a lot of emphasis on that because that's the new one um and they've already got dlc for the newest movie and for the newest miniseries daima which is coming out also this month um so yeah you're going to see a lot of retreading in dragon ball z games and fans do expect it they want to be able to re-experience the story and they've already been complaining that this one's on the skimpy side um but again when they've spent time focusing on the story it often comes at the costing them more of those precious character slots and uh and even though the fans don't reconcile it as much uh the character slots are ultimately more important than the in-depth story see ultimate tenkaichi for reference um so yeah and they're still including what if and they're including custom scenarios which they haven't mentioned yet maybe they will mention it but that's a huge game changer there even though i'm expecting it to be simpler than a lot of people are, i think are imagining it to be um but it's definitely a feature that i am going to be really getting into and i know a lot of other people will as well because you can upload them and other people can play through them you can literally make your own series here with weekly releases right your own dragon ball mini series and um, you know you don't have oc characters to use but you've got 180 when the dlc comes 200 characters uh, that you'll be able to plug into this this mini series that you're uploading so it's it's that's definitely new that's that's their new take with there and that that was smart on their take because as they brought up in this video, again, you know, we played through this story so many times, especially recently. You know, we played through the original version with Kakarot. We played through the remixed version with Xenoverse. And by extension as well, Super Dragon Ball Heroes and other games as well. Uh, even Fighter Z didn't offer much in terms of a new story. You know, it's there, but you're still fighting the same old enemies. And, you know, that's a side effect of when people play a Dragon Ball game, they're expecting Frieza, Cell, and boo to be in there and so you have to, you might as well use those characters of the story in some capacity which means recycling things to some degree or another um along with the other familiar faces that people want to see there because they like their characters so i can't blame developers for recycling the story and i actually kind of think it's a good thing it's skimpy because uh if it was more in depth it would be laborious to get through so because it's going to be it's going to be shorter and quicker to the point uh, it's going to be easier to work through and then get to the, some of that custom content. That's what we're really going to be chewing on this time around, uh, as far as single-player content goes. Being the official Tenkaichi 4 could be the kick in the pants the franchise needs, but I think a new, exciting direction is the way to go. This game will no doubt sell millions on name recognition alone, but I think its impact will quickly fade. I don't think we'll talk about it the same way years after release. I hope I'm proven wrong, though. A lot of people look back fondly and call Tenkaichi 3 a high watermark, and they deserve to be happy too. One of my friends is really excited about this game and couldn't give a flying nimbus about the game style being played out. I hope DBZ Sparking Zero is more than the same thing in prettier packaging. I hope it outdoes itself and is more fun than I got from the matches I played. Maybe it'll exceed expectations, but mine are very tempered. In the meantime, I'll be hoping for a better use of the light. All right, so wrapping up the review, a lot of posturing for the rest. Basic bottom line for this guy is he wanted a new Fighter Z. Uh, he's disappointed that casual D Dragon Ball Z games exist and that nobody should be playing them until another Fighter Z comes out. Uh, you know, again, not a good take. Not a good take, guys. It is different than what people are taking it out there as. Uh, and but yeah, there's nothing wrong with wanting more Fighter Z. I loved Fighter Z. It was a fantastic game. I'd very much like to have another one, and again, I'm reiterating from before, I'm repeating myself, but it bears repeating. Fighter Z is a great game. I hope Arxis gets a chance to make another one. There's other Arxis games to play in the meantime, if you like their style, you know. And like I said, they just came out with the Marvel vs. Capcom set, which has a very similar play style, per chance, to Fighter Z. So there's definitely other things to do in the meantime, and Fighter Z is still around, and still a fantastic game. 
So it's still supported by the creators. So, you know, there is that. But the the selling point of this game that this guy goes completely over his head is that uh, the reason they're going back is because, as he mentioned in this video, there's diminishing returns on the newer titles since 2020. So people are starting to lose interest. So they're going back and bringing back a big title because, again, popular fan sentiment is that that's what they want. And a big thing of this coming back for me personally is I'm I'm very thankful for this because gameplay-wise, as I said before, I'm not the biggest fan of Xenoverse or of Kakarot. So for me, it's been a dry spell since the past, last generation, console generation. I was still a console gamer. You know, I've only had Fighter Z really to keep me busy. And Fighter Z, again, it has a small story mode. So single player wise, there's not a lot of content there. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm a casual player, so I'm not going to have as much fun online getting my butt kicked over and over again by people who know the more subtle mechanics of the game. <laughs> you know, so it's, I would like to be able to get into a DBZ game that actually has better gameplay than what we've been getting. And, uh, and the, the old sparking engine, while it is dated and it's not as good as Raging Blast in a lot of ways, is at least, a, you know, a more comfortable area for me than the, the kind of spammy style that we've gotten with uh, the Xenoverse and uh, Kakarot games, you know? I should have been all over Kakarot. I'm a huge fan of the franchise. It covers a lot of the story, but I, I couldn't care less about the fishing mechanics or mining for ore or... Uh, or the side quests and, and trying to get money so you can... I'm not going to get into it, but... Um, I didn't enjoy those games at all. So I'm looking forward to just being able to enjoy the core gameplay again. You know, yeah, if, this, if the story's a little subpar, okay. Like, I, like you said in this video, we've seen this story. So we've got some what-if scenarios to make it up, which is new. And we've got the custom, which he didn't even mention at all. Probably wasn't in his build. Again, another disadvantage to making that clickbait review you know a lot of other people those middle tier uh, dragon ball z community creators who they've already made their reviews and they're on embargo until the release date so that they can post their review that they've made of this pre-built version with no online play is not going to be a, a, an uh, accurate review or it's certainly not an analysis so it's 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 clickbait this is the downside of making clickbait uh you don't have the full story and you don't know what you're talking about and you're, you don't have all the eggs in one basket, but you're, you're firing your load prematurely. So, that's that, you know. Again, there's nothing wrong with competitive fighters in this series, and I'm glad we have competitive Dragon Ball Z fighters at all. Because uh, there was a time where you didn't get them. You know, Super. No, most people didn't know about Super Dragon Ball Z back in the day. You know, that was a different kind of game, and uh, to this day, it's not the most popular one. You know, uh, Extreme Butoden. It was a portable title. Most people couldn't get their hands on it. It's a fantastic game, also made by Arxis. But if you can't play it, what good does it do, right? So, yeah, that's that's the situation we're in. This, again, is, is a misinformed take. Uh, he's missing a lot of his information. A lot of people had more emotional reactions to it. A lot of people want to argue about what constitutes an arena fighter. And, uh, and they want to get into the... That, you know, what people want, what people don't want. Casual fighters are going to appeal to a broader audience in general. You know, casual audience is bigger than the competitive one. So, yeah, it's, it's going to sell, especially if it's... And this game in particular is already topping the pre-order charts. The pre -order, physical copies are sold out all over the place. Um, it's number one on Steam and a bunch of other websites and on different networks. It's... Uh, you have basically two generations of Dragon Ball fans coming together for this. Because you have the old fans who probably haven't played since Tenkaichi, or may some of them have never even played a DBC game. Some of them grew up watching it as a kid, and by the time they were older, they just weren't playing the games anymore. You know, they, they're adults now, doing adulting things. And then there's the new generation who got on with, you know, Kai and, or most likely Super, you know, who've been playing games like... Uh, Xenoverse and Kakarot, and that's how they know the series. Uh, some of them only know it from Dragon Ball Z Abridged, my god. But, <laughs> it's, you know, this is the new crowd coming in with it, and now they've got, they get to experience what all the other fans are telling them is, you know, one of the best games, historically speaking, ever made for Dragon Ball. So, and in a, in a new package. So you're getting these two crowds together, and you're getting big numbers, and you think a casual audience in general is going to come around for their turn at it. You know, until the next big anime fighter but dragon ball is the biggest anime property so and the the custom content alone those custom missions that they've added custom events whatever they call it 
uh, that is going to add a lot of replay value to this, you know, and there's going to be, because there's going to be a competitive edge to it, there is going to be online play, rollback programming, and all, as long as it runs well, you're going to have an audience there as well, probably until the next, you know, there's going to be some people who are just because it's the newest thing, but Dragon Ball Z-wise, who knows when the next DBZ game is going to come out with online play, you know, Xenoverse 3 or whatever, so it's, it's probably going to last a long time there for that, because that crowd's going to stick around. The regular casual crowd's going to move on when the next casual game comes. But, um, and the single player fans are still going to have that custom story stuff to work on. So, yeah, it's it's going to have a longer lifespan than this guy thought it would. Uh, not a good tape, not an informed take. So, that's my take on this bad take. I uh, hope you guys found this video informative. Uh... Either way, hopefully I'll catch you guys next time. This is Grim signing off saying stay salty.